Hey folks, there's a kinda unwritten rule when it comes to graphics card AIBs that add in board partners which take the GPUs from Nvidia or AMD and turn them into the products that you and I buy. And that rule is that not all AIBs put the same amount of care and effort into their cards depending on whose GPU they're building it around. You might remember my own ROG Strix RX Vega 64, a great card once you amend its flaws, but a card that should not really have been released how it was, with poor power profiles and an ineffective VRM cooling solution. The Strix offering was kind of a minimum effort release, which was in stark contrast to the Nvidia based Strix cards, a great looking card for sure, and a great GPU. But as a package, it only came into its stride once the end user sorted out ASUS's negligent shortcomings and corner cutting. But I guess that's an example of a more neutral AIB. There are, however, AIBs which partner exclusively to either Nvidia or AMD. On the green side, you've got companies like EVGA and Palette, while AMD has the likes of PowerColor, Azrox, XFX, who actually used to be a green team exclusive, and of course, the stalwart from the ATI days. Sapphire, and it's a graphics card from Sapphire that's going to be the focus of today's video, the Sapphire Nitro Plus Vega 64. Now Sapphire is exclusively AMD, but they've got a history in providing really high quality cards, but because they've not got the same clout in the general market as say Strix ROG, then at this point we can actually find these Nitro Vega 64 cards for less than the Strix, so I thought it would be interesting to see what you're actually getting. Well, first things first, although this card might look like the limited edition Nitro Plus, it's actually the run-of-the-mill model, and there's a few key differences between both of them. If you whack Nitro Plus Vega into Google, chances are it's going to be an LE card you're going to find, with an illuminated shroud and mention of vapour chambers galore. Now, this regular Nitro Plus model is a little bit cut back but it's still a very hefty card, and it still uses the same 3 fan design, with the outermost larger 92mm fan spinning one way, and the middle 80mm fan spinning the opposite way, ensuring even airflow across the fin stack. Now being a Vega 64, it's of course based on the 14nm Vega 10 XT GPU, and features the full complement of 64 compute units, hence Vega 64, which gives us 4096 stream processors, 256 TMUs and 64 ROPs. The clock speeds see a boost from the Vega 64 reference spec of 1200 megahertz on the base and 1536 MHz on the boost to 1373 MHz on the base which is an increase of about 14% and 1580 on the boost which is an additional 3%. Although this particular model actually boosted past 1.6 GHz on its own under ample thermal conditions which sees the card produce a theoretical floating point 32 performance of around 13 teraflops. The card also uses 8GB of HBM2 which clocks in at 945MHz on a 2048-bit memory bus, offering a bandwidth of 484GB per second. A nice inclusion here is also the dual BIOS, something that the Strix card lacked, and we get the same PWM fan headers on the PCB of the card, which allows us to connect up case fans for additional control of airflow in response to GPU temperatures rather than CPU or motherboard temperatures. And of course we've got the same two 8-pin PCIe power connectors, one less than the limited first edition card. So I guess first things first, we should probably try and check out the temperatures as it compares to my fixed Strix card. Now the Strix card's obviously had the thermal pad replaced and is also using Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut as its thermal interface material. It should be noted that the Nitro card here has been tested with the same undervolting profile as the Strix card and the same 60% fan speed, as well as in the same room, the same case and the same controlled ambient temperature. So first up, the HBM2 temperatures on the Nitro card actually come in lower than on the Strix card. Now we'd already dropped the temperatures by a good few degrees when changing the thermal interface material on the Strix, so it's really good to see that the Nitro is providing an even better result. The same thing happens with the GPU temperature, ever so slightly lower than the modified Strix card. But interestingly enough, when we check out the GPU hotspot temperature, the Strix card takes the win here, even though it is a very slight victory. But of course, we're not going to just simply leave it there. We're going to take apart the Sapphire Nitro Plus Vega 64, give it a good old clean up, add on some generic thermal compound, and see if that improves things even further. 
Now the Sapphire Nitro Vega 64 card, it's actually a really nice card to work on. First up we've got the fans, now these are held on by one screw, no cables, and simply click into place on the shroud. If you're familiar with any of Sapphire's other cards, like the, like the RX 570, RX 580 or 590, this fan arrangement is probably going to be pretty familiar to you, and it makes cleaning or replacing the fans a breeze. Now the plastic heat shroud on top of that huge fin stack can simply be removed by unscrewing four screws, and it simply flips round and allows us to see the full complement of fins and heat pipes. And as you can see, it's a densely packed unit. We get a 5 plus 3 arrangement for the heat pipes, and to be perfectly honest with you, there's not too much dust here. So a quick blast over with a data vac should see the majority of the dust removed, and then we can move on to replacing the thermal paste. Now it's a simple affair again here, four screws, secure the heatsink to the PCB, and with that removed, we can simply lift off the main heatsink. As you can see, it's a mixture of aluminium and copper, which differs a little bit from the limited edition which features a vapour chamber, and you can also see just the amount of care and attention that Sapphire has put into the VRM cooling on this card, with its own dedicated heat sinks and heat pipes, simply for the VRM cooling. Now the PCB itself is actually very similar to the limited edition, we've even got RGB fan headers here, which if you took apart the limited edition card, you would be plugging in the LEDs on the plastic shroud. It's also very nice to see we've got the same moulded GPU package as we've seen on the Strix, now I much prefer this to the unmoulded variants that we get in some Vega cards, as it simply makes applying thermal paste and spreading it just that little bit easier. Just by looking at the Sapphire card though, you kind of get the impression that a lot of effort has been put into it. There's plates galore and these back plates are actually using thermal pads to aid in heat transfer. Like I've mentioned, we've got that separate VRM cooling and the whole package just kind of feels like it's been designed by an engineering team rather than a bunch of bean counters. So with some fresh MX2 paste applied to the GPU package and everything screwed back together, what has it done to the thermal results? Well, prior to the quick refresh, we was already returning lower temperatures on the HPM, and this has dropped even further. The HPM temperature during the Time Spy stress test only hit about 56 degrees after about 10 minutes. The same with the GPU, which stayed under 55 degrees through the whole test. In comparison, the Strix card, it was looking to hit about 60 degrees under the same conditions. But it's the hotspot here that has seen the biggest drop. Now remember, against the Strix card, the Nitro was actually returning warmer temperatures, and now we're seeing a delta of about 1 or 2 degrees, which is great to see. So how can you really sum up the Sapphire Nitro Plus Vega 64? Well, if you're looking at a lot of forums, you're going to see the same opinion branded about that the Sapphire card is the best built card of the bunch. And after taking it apart and just checking over the detail that's been put into it, I think I would probably have to agree. Now there's nothing against my Strix card, I really like it. It is solidly built and it performed really well once I'd fixed all the problems. But out of the box, well, the Sapphire card certainly has the Strix card's number. Sure, it might be a little bit bulkier, but it's got that nice brace included, which helps keep it straight in your case. And when comparing it to the LE edition, we are missing that vapour chamber heatsink and a few extra LEDs, but in all honesty, it still looks fantastic in the case. There's ample amount of features on the card, and it actually runs really, really quiet. Well, when it comes to the Sapphire card then, I guess I'm pretty much sold on it. It looks great in the case, it performs even better than my modified Strix card, and surprisingly for a Vega card, it's cool and it's quiet. So if you've got room for one in your case, then at this point, seeing as it's one of the cheaper Vega 64 cards here in the UK, it would certainly be the one that I would go for. But hey, I'm going to leave it there for today folks, thanks for sticking around this kind of pointless teardown of a Sapphire Nitro Plus Vega 64, but I would love to know which one you would go for, if you'd go for the Strix, if you'd go for the Sapphire, or if the Power Color and Gigabyte cards are more your style. But hey, that's enough of me rambling on about Vega cards again. Remember to like, share and subscribe for more content like this, and I'll just say take care. And I'll see you all in the comment section down below, and in the next video.